say we have a series of observations, the red spot here, for the relationship between hemoglobin A1c and blood glucose level, these are fantasy figures. And we uh, assume that there is a linear regression line after doing some curve fitting, which I won't discuss here. I did that in another video. We came up with that linear regression line and we want to find the 95% prediction interval. And that has the upper bound here and the lower bound here and a 95% confidence interval. That is this one versus that one. What's the difference between those two? When you just look at the prediction interval, that means that 95% of the y values will be within that range. They all are inside that range. That means if you ever use from the same population another sample, you might find values here between this and that and this one happens to be outside that range but remember it's only a 95% prediction interval. Is it an outlier? That is a, a different issue that I discussed in another video. But let's assume that this is correct and we found these prediction intervals. You could also find the confidence intervals. That range is usually much narrower, it's always much narrower. And all it says is there is a 95% probability that the true best fit line for the population lies within those intervals. So it could be this dotted line or that dotted line. They all are possible with a 95% confidence. So how do you calculate those boundaries? So here they are together. We need formulas. These are the values that the curve is based on. X and Y values. Then we calculate what we would predict, what we would expect if there is a linear trend line. We do that with the trend function. The trend function in this case is a multi-cell array function. So you select multiple cells ahead of time and you call the trend function. The trend function says what are your y values, b3 through b7, your a values, a3 through a7. Don't click on OK because this is an array formula. So you do control shift OK and you get these predicted values. Then we are going to find the minimum and maximum confidence intervals and the minimum and maximum prediction intervals. The formulas for those intervals are like this. So we need a lot of values to find. The difference between the two is that this one has one plus the rest. So how do we get all these values? So we need a student's t value for the 95% fit. The standard error based on the number of cases, one divided by the number of cases. The difference between the uh, average or the mean and a specific value squared divided by, sorry, the explained variation. So we need all these values. How do we get these? Again, it's an array formula. You select multiple cells ahead of time and you call the linest function, a linear estimate. The linest function says what are your known y's, the glucose levels, your known axes, the hemoglobin A1c levels, constant true and you want additional statistics. These are the additional statistics. For, again, you have to do control shift OK. And those are the values. What do they stand for? This one is the slope, that's the intercept. Standard error of the slope of the intercept, the R squared value, the standard error of the Y values, 
F value for the variances, the decrease of freedom, and then for the unexplained and the explained variation, the values. Calculate how many cases we have. I used count A3 through A17. Find the average of all the values in column A. Use the function DEVSQ. It returns the sum of the squares of deviations. Then we need the T inverse function. The student's t-test is much more reliable than the normal test when you have less than 30 cases. So I'm going to use the student's t-test, two-tailed, on both sides, with a 5% probability of error, degrees of freedom, that is the number of cases minus 2 in this case, And finally, the standard error, that is the square root of L6 divided by L5. I explained that here. That is the standard error. Then we are going to calculate the confidence intervals, the minimum and the maximum. The difference between the two is that this one is... The predicted value minus the confidence level, and that is plus the confidence level. So we are going to put in there this formula, or to put it differently, that one. So it is basically D3 minus. I named the cell already for the T value, that is this one. I named already standard error, I gave the cell a name, so the formula makes a little more sense. Then I took the square root of 1 divided by the number of cases, that cell I called count, plus A3 in this case, minus the mean of the axes, to the power of 2, so I take all the differences, to the power of 2 and divide by SSXX, that is this one. And we do the same here, but there we do D plus that value. A similar story for this one, but now we have to use 1 plus 1 divided by N, because this is the prediction interval. And a similar story for that column. Then I plotted all of these. And all these values come from that sheet. It's, it's a bit work if you want to visually show it. But we get the prediction interval and the confidence interval. If you had more cases... Of course, the range would be narrower. I have the same kind of situation, but I used more observations. So the plotted one has a much narrower range. So that means that for the confidence interval, that my linear regression line has a much narrower range of varying. If you want to know much more about statistics, and you should if you want to work with all of this. This is a very simple explanation. Then I would go for my book Excel 2013 for Scientists or the CD-ROM 2013 for Scientists. It has this range of issues. And one of them is regression analysis and curve fitting. And there is the predictability one that we discussed here. And there is a lot on statistical analysis. How do you plot data? How do you do data analysis in Excel and some general spreadsheet techniques? You can find these two tools at genesispc.com. 
and that will take you further into Excel.